Thank you, Michelle. Uh, if you wouldn't mind also turning, if you, we said silence your phones, but if you want to turn them off like we do in the tent and go to airplane mode and turn Wi-Fi and Bluetooth off, I think it'll kind of have a calmer environment for us. And I'm, glad, I'm really glad I'm not wearing a wireless mic. I'm usually up here speaking, talking about wireless, wearing a wireless mic, which feels a little hypocritical. All right, um, let's see. Let's get into it. This is the Succeed Room. Let's succeed. My background, uh, I lived and worked in Silicon Valley since 1990, so I am a tech person. I was a troubleshooter. Originally, I was a customer support person for supercomputers um, and workstations. Then I became an engineer, a software engineer, and eventually a software designer. Uh, I had a passion for uh, empowering people with personal technology. Uh, I used to meet with like Tony Fidel, who later designed the iPhone in the mid-90s. I wrote papers about personal technology at Stanford and attributes of it. Uh, so I really, and my, my goal at, my, at the time on my resume was to empower people with personal technology. That has not exactly gone the way we all thought it would. Okay, and you know, so we all had really good intentions and a lot of the people who originally did that, including myself, um, are, you know, we're working towards something even better. I mean, if they were really empowering us, we'd be calm and masterful. And that is not kind of what's going on. So uh, I did have two boys, uh, two boys on the, with developmental delays, autism symptoms, sensory issues. Um, and I had multiple chronic health issues myself. And it took me a while to figure out that they were both related. Um, so this is me in 2009, 20 pounds lighter than I am now. I'm about 150 pounds. This is me at 131 pounds. Okay. And that's after I detoxed from uh, metals. So I got, rid of, I got rid of mercury poisoning. I'm eating all organic and exercising, and I can't keep the weight on. And my kids are recovering from autism. Everything's going well for them, but it's not working for me. So I normally, let's see, so I, I systematically looked at everything, right? I was looking at everything I could look at, and I, wanted, I didn't want to be, and at the time, like you know, 10 or so years ago, we had Inconvenient Truth coming out, and you had people in Texas or something denying, because they worked in oil and gas, denying there was climate change. And I said, well, I don't want to be one of those people that doesn't look at their own stuff, right? I want to make sure that I you know, objectively step back and you know, look at everything. Because I was actually starting to have problems getting a cell phone next to my head, I would start to feel it. And my body was instinct, basically at the time, my, my body felt like there was a problem with the tech, but my brain was saying, oh, it's fine, it's all well tested. Well, you know, someone was wrong and, you know, and it was my head, okay. So, um, yeah, technology exposure is one of the last things I looked at, but may have had the largest impact and probably one of the first things I would do now, uh, starting um, to detox kids and, and adults, too. So I'm going to do a little bit of a, a quick thing about the biology, autism, the biology, and the environment. Uh, just so you know why this links in. Like, you may think, well, why is this related to autism? What's going on? It's actually one of the highest, to me, this is one of the kind of the most clear links. So we have, uh, has anyone seen the study from Stanford years ago about, um, I think maybe 2013, about genetics and autism? And so uh, they looked at the genetics, they looked at the environment, they studied twins, basically. So it's the, the classic way of figuring out how much is genetic and how much is the environment. And when they looked at twins, including some identical twins who one has autism and one does not, right? That's pretty clear. You know, it showed on average that 38% of autism is genetic and 62% is environment. Well, that leaves a lot of, you know, you can't necessarily control your genes, but that leaves 62% you can control. Um, now, so there are more than a thousand genetic risk factors now for autism, but the largest cluster in a study that Martha Herbert did a couple years ago of 600 of them was in calcium channel signaling. Are people familiar with calcium channel signaling? A little bit? Okay. So the calcium channels are voltage gated. So they're ion channels that are on the cell membrane and voltage opens and closes them. So can you start to see why maybe electrical stuff might be a bit of an issue here? Okay, voltage gated. So what do these things do? You know, I knew about calcium channels for a long time and I knew kind of whatever, but I didn't understand what they did actually. And so just to give you a little bit of the purpose, calcium channels excites the neurons. So you don't wanna be, there are times when you really do not want to miss something. When your life is in danger or where there's a really big reward going on first date, I don't know, there's a lot of interesting times when you're gonna be on it. And so your body excites the system so that you err on the side of, 
you know, not missing a thing, okay? But of course, that's a really intense state to be in. A lot of our kids are in that state all the time. It's a really intense state to be in, and it's very, um, it drains a lot of power from the body. And you all know when you kind of finish a talk or something that you kind of relax and things dial back down. Well, our kids don't, that doesn't happen with our kids in general. So they're all kind of jacked up because they've got a lot of calcium channel firing. So it gets you into this yeah, more sensitive and high-strung state. Does that sound like anybody we know? Uh, including the parents. Okay. So, I, I, you know, exactly. So let's talk about autism risks and symptoms. You know, we talked about the genetics and calcium channel. Brain development is clearly an issue. Oxidative stress is a risk factor. Sensory issues, inflammation, uh, blood-brain barrier breaching, gut issues, immune system issues. What's common to all these? Calcium channel signaling. Very obscure paper that came out in 2007. I can't even find the author at this point. It wasn't really published. But to me, it was brilliant. And really, it was about calcium channel pathology. And it really, wow, we've got a full house. Thank you guys for coming so much. So um, that, that paper was just remarkable for me. Uh, Martin Paul sent that to me. And um, I just kind of started putting these together. And people don't talk about this so much. So the calcium channels, it is confusing. You see all these symptoms all over the place. But there is kind of one common pathway that's most suspect. So um, uh, Martha Herbert introduced me to the concept of total load theory or allostatic load. Uh, Patty Lemer has talked about this as well, who, who wrote the book um, Outsmarting Autism, I think pioneered the term. And she thinks of autism not as a, um, it's, she thinks of autism as a state, not a trait. So it's not a lifetime trait. It's not a genetic thing that you're going to be in forever. It's more like being in bankruptcy or being in debt, right? So it's a temporary state. And if you're overloaded, you're going to stay in that state. And there's many factors. So if you have, let's say, a vaccine injury, you do not get a get out of jail free card for glyphosate. And that was one of my biggest problems is as a troubleshooter, I was used to seeing computers fail with one thing. And I really focused on, I over focused on mercury for about 15 years. And then I've really broadened my horizons to look at and realize that it's not about one environmental factor, but maybe it is about one pathway in the body that's suspect and that can be impacted by multiple environmental factors. So when I go to a conference now, I used to, if people would go to a conference, they'd be, oh, it's this, it's this, it's this. And now I say, instead of fighting over it's this and this, this, I say, yes, and. Yes, it's glyphosate, and this, and this. It's all of these things together. So it's not a fight. So the calcium channels are a key point of focus of overload. They're excited and calmed and calmed by a wide range of factors both environmental and physiological. So again, an excited state of overload can be considered excitotoxicity. So too much internal calcium can cause oxidative stress and even DNA damage and mitochondrial damage. And this is how, I, I don't know, I think of the nervous system now, you've heard of people saying, oh, that person's high strung. So I tend to think of the, I, I like to think of the nervous system like a stringed instrument, like a musical instrument, and you can tune it up and down. And you know, just like a, a musician tunes before they start playing, we really need to take time to make sure we get in the right state. And I know a lot of people with sensory issues, we've talked a lot about regulation. And we do all these sensory things to get you in regulation. But there are a lot of physiological things you can do and a lot of environmental things that can play with this as well. Imagine you're a musician and someone comes up and starts detuning your, you know, your violin as you're playing. Well, that's kind of the way EMF works. You're sitting there and getting overexcited and you don't know, you know, there's this invisible thing, you have no idea what's going on. So some of the things that tune down is calcium, uh, calcium signaling, uh, magnesium, down regulates. If, if you're low in magnesium, your calcium channels will be hyperactive. Um, B12, uh, B6, folate, glutathione, balanced minerals, having enough mineral balance. Sounds like things that we kind of have been using in the field, eh? Right? Things that excite the nervous system, wireless and EMF. Toxic metals, there's a, a metal ion receptor called the Midas on the outside of the calcium channel, and that can get screwed up and screw up the signal, how the signaling works. Roundup can excite the nervous system directly through the calcium channels or through the NDMA receptor that's a glutamate receptor. MSG, right? Any kids do well on MSG? Right. Uh, infections, okay, ah, now you're starting to see, oh, well, how does this stuff all go together? Infections, inflammation, low glutathione, low minerals, and more. So you can start to see that you have an ability to maybe start tuning your children like stringed instruments and yourself. 
Okay, so this is the total load theory that we talked about with, um, that Patty Lima and Martha Herbert have been talking a lot about. And again, it's not just one thing. And, and as I spent 15 years with a lot of time and resources trying to recover my kids, I, had, I was doing things all over the map, and I was trying to think how to coherently pull this all together, and I realized there were some categories of things that were happening. Now, you're either treating, the, usually everyone just jumps in and you treat the, the child themselves, right? You're either removing something bad or adding something good, right? And then also with the environment, you can remove something bad or add something good. And there's something kind of in between, Dr. Klinghart works on a lot too, is like the autonomic nervous system. So your body can be stuck in fight or flight mode, which is not an, a state, or it can uh, over or underreact to some environmental factor, or it can even stop regulating. So it could just, just kind of shut down and not really correctly tune itself to the environment. So let's say, so when I think of recovering my kids now, what I kind of recommend is a is kind of a process of creating a safe environment first and going down through all these loads on the right and lightening those loads and then focusing on, so now you've created a safe environment and then now you want your child to feel safe and dial out of fight or flight mode with various mechanisms, breathing, cranial sacral therapy, et cetera. So getting into out of fight or flight mode where you're not gonna detox, your brain doesn't even have, you don't, the front of your brain doesn't even have access to circulation as much. It's all in the back in reactive mode. So get back into rest, digest, healing, parasympathetic mode. And then we can start playing around with the normal, um, uh, the, the, the um, what do we call it, biomedical training. The, the normal biomedical stuff. So a lot of times we jump in and do the biomedical right away. But I would say if I was doing it all again, and my doctor and I both kind of said, geez, we did everything. We got results, but we actually did everything backwards. I would completely do it differently. So I did it all backwards and totally screwed up and I still got really good results. So I hope you guys do a better job. And that's my job here to kind of pass on that knowledge. Okay, so you create this environment and then hopefully you get kind of a, a lightening and you lighten the load and you see your child go back from being overloaded to having an abundance of support factors. So, um, wow, is this the whole thing? Okay, so oh, I think we got a little bit more than this. So. Um, I have some talks and references that uh, we have on the internet. So, and as a matter of fact, this whole talk is already referenced uh, as well, I think, on the internet. Uh, actually, I haven't uploaded yet. So Simplifying Autism Improvement and Recovery is a booklet that we have down at our, um, at our booth downstairs. And that's everything that I wish I could have shared with my, my past self back in 2002 and three. So if I could just go back in time, like Interstellar, did you guys see that movie? You could go back inside and say like, you know, give something to yourself in time and say, don't worry, it's all gonna be okay, do this. That's the booklet. Uh, and it goes with a talk I did called, you know, Simplifying Autism Improvement Recovery. I had another talk at, at AES called Simplifying Autism Removing Barriers, where I took that talk and combined it with another talk called Autism in Your Home, where I went through not just EMF, but all these environmental factors in your home, like one slide for everything, for water, for air quality, for lights. And so if you really wanna do a quick scan you can look at that talk, or we have a little pamphlet downstairs um, at our booth on that talk as well. Um, the paper, uh, Martin Paul's paper, or actually this is his talk at Autism One. He's came for about two, three years to Autism One conference. He's an expert on the calcium channels, biophysicist. He did a paper, EMFs, or he did a talk at Autism One. EMFs and chemicals is the two main drivers of the autism epidemic mechanisms of action. So if you really wanna see how this all, if you really like to nerd out on the, the biophysics of things, then uh, watch that talk. Uh, and also, um, I have a, a link called Autism and EMF Published Research. All right, thanks, Michelle. All right, we got 15 more minutes. And we're gonna try to end quite early and, um, and take a lot of questions, because usually when I talk about this topic, I can talk about this topic for 10 minutes and then do three hours of questions, because once you get it, you, then you, just, you start going, what do I do next, right? We'll talk a little bit about autism and wireless and some of the historical background so Dr. Klinghart did a pilot study in 2002. So Dr. Klinghart is up in Seattle. He had a very interesting uh, clientele. He had uh, a lot of Microsoft people and then non-tech people. And he noticed all the autism cases were coming from the tech people. And so he was a little suspect. He also had a friend he was living with at the time who was a building biologist who knew about electric fields and magnetic fields and EMF. And so they did a little pilot study and they found basically that the neurotypical kids had dramatically lower levels of exposure than in the, in the mom's pregnancy environment and in the baby's sleep environment for um, electric fields and wireless levels. 
And, uh, and those levels actually pretty much match the building biology guidelines. So, and you don't even have to be perfect. You don't have to be in the perfectly safe zone. If you can stay out of the purple and red extreme zones, like if you stay out of the extreme or the concern, severe concern mode, you might be okay. And again, it all depends on your genetics as well. I didn't, uh, sometimes I've gone into the rooms, I had to turn the slides early. Sometimes I've gone into the exact room you're in, measured it, and I put those up there to show you where you are now. This hotel is actually quite low on, in wireless, which is really nice. Uh, so it's down, um, I would say it's in the yellow zone for wireless. And I haven't measured, I, didn't, I was too lazy to measure electric and magnetic fields. I'll have to get, maybe I can get to that. If someone asks that, you can ask that as a question and I'll get my meter out. Um, in 2013, um, Martha Herbert and Cindy Sage, Martha Herbert from Harvard, Cindy Sage worked together collaboratively on a paper I asked them to do. I kind of said, you know, I'm hearing about calcium channels in autism, I'm hearing about calcium channels in EMF research. Should we, uh, is this something going on here? You know, right now at the time in 2010, they said one in 100 people were electrosensitive. It's like, well, wait, this sounds a lot like autism. So I asked Martha Herbert to look at the research and she called me back swearing. And she's pretty, pretty fun. Um, she, was, she was actually really thrown off by some, some very serious effects like blood brain barrier breaches and genetic damage that she didn't really know existed. She didn't know were peer reviewed and published studies. So we have things like in autism, we have de novo mutations. So we have non inherited mutations that frequently come from the dad side. So we're looking for gene genotoxic environmental factors or lifestyle factors. So cell phone in the pocket, laptop in the lap is a major concern. Uh, for autism. And if we only do one thing to prevent autism, uh, I would say it's, you know, really protect the, the, the dad sperm, especially, so in, in the preconception phase. And the rest, you know, a lot of the stuff we can repair after. We know we can fix kids, but I, I don't want to pass on a, a gene. If you've had millions of years of evolving genes, I don't want to pass in some random spurious defect uh, just because of a cell phone. So we have sperm damage from EMF exposure. We have inflammation. We have calcium channel um, problems. We have reduced melatonin for, in autism. We have reduced melatonin from EMF exposure. We have increased oxidation from autism and, ex and EMF exposure. We have decreased immune system and we have increased seizures. Basically what Martha Herbert said, the known symptoms of autism match known symptoms from EMF exposure. Now we're not claiming that it's, this is the only thing. It's a yes and, right, with all the other things that you know. And that paper was published in 2013. I said, Oh, great, the information's going to get out there, everyone's going to know, I can relax. No. Okay. So um, I got Martin Paul. So finally at, at that, I kind of realized, you know, this, this is not going to happen on its own. I talked to Martin Paul in 2014, and he was saying the same thing, that I, he kind of was coming to the conclusion that calcium channels and autism, he talked about the, he, he basically talked about the same things we just talked about. And I said, you know, we have got to get, you know, you speaking at a conference or something. And... Um, so in 2015, we went to Autism One, and I spoke and did like a parent's version, and Martin Paul did kind of a, the super nerd biophysics version of this. And so if you like to nerd out, again, here's his talk. Um, and he talked about chemicals activating the MDMA receptors, which is a glutamate receptor. Um, and that's why the low glutamate diet works really well. And so again, both of these mechanisms lead to intracellular calcium and damage and increased inflammation. So now what do we do? We've got 10 minutes left, and let's figure out what we're gonna actually do. So how do you, um, so does that make sense to you now? That's a, that's a really fast boom why we're talking about this issue and why I think it's a very credible, I think it's the most credible issue for autism, and I think it's one of the most uh, credible suspects that we have, and it's not getting as much traction as I think I'd like to see. So, um, and we still don't have exact proof that this is the issue, we don't have a, a full study. I'm working with Martha Herbert on that. But I would say it's such a strong suspect that you should be dialing down your exposures now. And um, we're actually getting pretty dramatic results as well. And we'll talk about that maybe in the other talk. So we evolved in the Earth's magnetic field, in the Earth's field. It's a big magnetic field. And it, and it doesn't, it's not just static. It varies with lightning strikes in the ionosphere. It goes at about 7.83 hertz, which is our alpha brainwave level. So it's kind of like a drumbeat for our bodies and for our brains. And we're used to that. It's a nice smooth wave and it keeps us all connected. But now we actually live inside and we're a little bit closer to these man-made fields. And they're 60 hertz 
And they don't vary around like, like um, lightning does or like a babbling brook. They're kind of dun 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 like jaws, 60 hertz. And so we've had these fields coming in the house for a while now, for decades. And we've had magnetic fields and electric fields. And they're coming from different directions now and they're different frequencies. And sometimes they're a little noisy. And sometimes they have uh, digital square waves in them that our bodies don't really like. Or sometimes they have little spiky peaks in them that our bodies can feel. And you can see that you know, since the 80s especially, things have really dialed up. Similar interesting time frame uh, to the autism rise. OK, so, so we live in those homes right now. We are like a fish in water in those homes. The magnetic fields especially go right through your body like a fish in water or like an MRI. Okay, so how do we get out of this? You know, what do we do? So I want to give you the experience. What we've done is we've created this wireless clean room. Now, it doesn't block magnetic fields and other things, but it will block wireless signals. And we do find that, I don't want to bias you too much, but we find that a lot of people do have an experience. I would say most people have an experience when they go in the tent. I'm not going to tell you what that is now, but I want you to have your own experience. So I can talk about the science all day, but what I have learned is when I, if I'm talking at you and pushing the science at you, then people kind of resist and say da da this. But if you have your own experience, it lands. And you, you can't deny that. And it's not a fight. I'm not trying to manipulate you. I don't really, I don't care about manipulating. I don't really have any skin in the game here. But I do want to stop seeing people suffer. So have this experience. It's downstairs if you can. It is a very rare experience to go from wireless levels here to wireless levels like back like it's, you know, caveman days or even the 1980s. So the health effects of wireless, not just autism, but I think for the parents as well, and parents and other friends and, and so forth, the most common symptom reported is insomnia, sleep disruption. The second most common is uh, ringing in the ears, headaches, fight or flight mode or overexcitation, attention problems, memory problems. I always joke that I, I had all these things except I don't remember having memory problems. Um, reproductive harm. Uh, and DNA damage and more. So basic strategies. I just want you to think, don't think you need to go out and buy anything right away. To start with, you can start with the bedroom and sleep environment. So we're, we're where our bodies are trying to recharge and do our mel you know, melatonin, clean our brains out and rebalance. Start with the bedroom and the sleep environment. And you can just do turn off or move away these different devices. So unplug the device or turn it off or move the device farther away or if you can't move those things, you can move away from the exposure. And then repeat these things for other locations, like places where your child does his, uh, his or her homework, or where your office is. And track your progress with, take, you know, track your actions in progress. Have a little log book or something. Do your ATEC scores. In the, form, in the future, we'll have more formal stuff, like Taka has. Um, to do this. I'm working with Martha Herbert on this on a clinical database where you can put your ATEC scores in, all your EMF scores and other environmental scores and we'll start tracking these things and we'll really get some big data going on this. So I have a quick list of items, I think about 25 items. Wait, we're getting, we might not have time for questions. I'm going to go through this quickly so we have five minutes. So here are things that are in your home that you want to kind of start focusing on first, like wearables. The closest things to your body will have the biggest impact. So if you have a fitness tracker, especially a Fitbit, smart watches, you know, AirPods, headphones uh, that are wireless, um, turn those off or move them away. If you have a location tracker, if your kid's a runner, a wearable or carried unit, that can be a factor. And um, if you really, really want that but you st and you want to mitigate exposure, I can help with that a little bit too, talking about that. Electric blanket, motorized adjustable bed, baby monitor is actually a very big concern as those went from analog to digital in the 80s. Cell phones, not near the bed, tablets or iPads. If you have a digital assistant, they're quite high and constant emitters. Cordless phone base stations, uh, Wi-Fi router, LED plug-in clock can frequently be a migraine headache uh, magnetic field issue. Lamp or reading light, even when it's off, can be a big electric field. Power strip or extension cord, Transformers, those little plug-in electronics, have big magnetic fields. Television, especially the streaming devices. And these are, you know, you don't have to write this down. We have these printed out downstairs at our booth. So you can just chill. Everything's all good. I know. I know. I get so stressed about this. All right. 
You're not going to miss anything. I'm going to take care of you guys. Uh, desktop or laptop computer. Your refrigerator is a big magnetic field, especially these newer, and then also these smart refrigerators. A lot of these smart appliances are wireless all the time. So electrical appliances in general, so humidifiers, air conditioners, heaters, air filters, aquarium pumps. Uh, your electric meter itself, especially if you have a smart meter, well, the electric meter, the panel or sub-panel, radiant electric floor heating can be a big magnetic field. Your a smart meter this can be a, a big issue. A wireless alarm system, a lot of people have those. And a dimmer switches can create a lot of dirty electricity, and we, almost all of us have those. And three-way light switches can create, the way they're wired creates a big uh, magnetic field. So if you can turn a light on from two different places, that's a three-way switch. Okay, and then also fluorescent compact lights and LED lights can, um, not only are they noisy potentially and you know, flickering light, but they um, create dirty electricity. So noise in our electric systems. So we do have some basic meters you can get to start measuring these things. So we've got those down at the, um, at the booth. I don't think we're going to have time to, to pull them out and play with them. But um, you can play with them downstairs if you want to take a meter home. And we have sim we're starting to do, I'm starting to do simplified instructions that says turn this on, do this, this. And, and you can start recording these levels in the different areas and creating a radar graph. This is from the Autism One conference. It was generally fairly low except for the wireless levels. So at this conference, we're in the yellow zone for wireless. So we're a little bit calmer here. And you can also, if this feels a little overwhelming to you, and it is very technical, um, you can hire a building biologist to measure your home or school. And they can also help you with complex shielding and mitigation issues. And this is it. So we've got about three or four minutes left. So I have resources. So this talk is... Um, at clv.us slash autism.wireless. I haven't uploaded it yet, but I will upload the slides. Amanda, can you remind me to do that? Where did Amanda go? In the back. Okay, thanks, Amanda. Um, and then we have our website, clearlightventures.com. We have a wireless safety card. I think, I think Amanda put them on, or no, which one did you put on everyone's seat? The safety card or? Both. Oh, yeah, I know. Okay, got it. So you should have had stuff on your seat, the card and, and the autism in your home pamphlet. We got extra literature. We're trying to we're trying to clear it out for new versions. Um, we also have a Facebook. It's a complex topic, and so you just need somebody to coach you through it. Uh, we have a Facebook group, EMF and Autism. We've got over 2,000 parents in the group, and and some electrosensitive adults, and um, EMF experts who just all help each other. There's a simple book that starts that if you want to if you like to read about this in more detail, uh, the book is the Non Tinfoil Hat Guide to EMFs. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not a big fan of the title, but the book is clear and well-written. Um, and when I did a film, I helped uh, an executive produce a film called Generation Zap that you can find on iTunes and Amazon. So those are the resources, and I think we have, all right, I have like two minutes for questions, and I have to, I told Michelle if I was late, she could come up and slap me, and oh my God, she's walking forward now. <laughs> okay, so, all right, um, let's see. Um, what if anything, can we do to protect ourselves from 5G? It's going to be everywhere. Honestly, I, I don't think 5G, we'll see how it goes. Um, 5G may fail before it really fully rolls out. So we'll see how that goes. But um, we'll talk, that's a, that's a more complex question. All right. Uh, what do we think of, what do we think of neurological damage from ultrasound? I know Cindy Sage, who is the EMF expert, was talking about that. I don't, I haven't really studied that so much. I know there is some concern. I've heard both yes and no on that, um, especially in the first trimester is a concern. I'm not a total expert at that one. one. Are you, you're, 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 getting, you're getting the hand ready. Oh my God. All right, let's see. Could you please recommend a gadget to measure electrosmog? We did that already. We just talked about that and that's it. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you so much. If you had.